Good morning, Faith Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us once again here online as we have our worship together, though not together. It's still very strange not seeing you and, and uh, fellowshipping with one another every Sunday morning and every Tuesday, but I'm thankful that we can get together online through these videos and through social media, and I encourage you to continue to share with one another, encourage one another, and pray for one another. But this morning, as I welcome you into our service here at Faith Baptist Church here in Namagongo, Chalewangela. And if you are watching us as a visitor, you're most welcome. And we thank you for visiting in our church through this means. And uh, if we can be of help to you, we'll be sharing our church phone numbers at the end. And I, I would ask that you please feel free to get a hold of us and, and contact us if we can be a help to you spiritually in, in sharing the truth of God's Word with you. Well, this morning as we begin, just a couple of announcements here. We want to praise the Lord for His provision. And God has continued to give us the opportunity to meet together. And, and I know this time of lockdown is a challenge for many, but I thank, the way, thank God for the way He has provided and for His protection on us and His health. The number of cases in Uganda have been very few, and we're thankful that God has protected us mostly from this coronavirus. And uh, I thank God also for His Word that we have the privilege of studying. But as we thank Him, we're also raising our requests to Him we know there are many in our community, even in our church, which are hungry, and we've been contacting our members about this opportunity to help those that do have needs of, of food or medicine, and if you would like to participate in that and you've not been able to, please uh, feel free to contact one of your pastors and we will give you in, information on how you can participate with that. Um, pr keep praying that God would end the corona here and, and uh, give wisdom to those that are seeking a solution, a vaccine and the right treatment, that they would know what the best way. God is the one who designed our bodies, and I pray that he would give that wisdom to man. And continue to pray that God would strengthen us as a body of Christ. And I'm thankful for the church family that we have, this local body, and uh, I love interacting with you. I enjoyed uh, the times that we could get together online through Zoom and, and through our WhatsApp chats, and I encourage you, continue to praise the Lord together and pray for one another through those things. And just a reminder that we are continuing our missions project. So giving for our missions project as well as tithes and offerings, it can be done through MTN Mobile Money. That number is 776 14 And I'll put that number in the notes. You can also give through our Standbook Bank account, and I'll put that number in the notes as well. But thank you for your faithfulness. And if you need to give towards uh, assisting those in need, we can also do it through that mobile money account. But be sure to pray for one another and continue serving God together, even though we are in different places right now. Our scripture reading this morning is going to come from Revelation chapter 1, from verse 1 up to verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, we'll be studying more about these seven churches of Revelation over the coming weeks. And this morning, starting off looking at how God introduces this chapter and this book here in Revelation 1 verses 1 to 3. I hope you have your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to follow along on the screen, but if you have your Bible, please, I encourage you to read from your copy of the scriptures there as I read here. Revelation 1, starting in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God, that we have truth, not based on opinion, not based on on someone's ideas, but based on your word, what you breathed through your Holy Spirit out the mouth of the Apostle John. Thank you that he was willing to be used to write and record this for us so that we can learn from you. I pray this morning you would give us understanding, a clearer vision of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is revealed in this book. And as we see him more, may we be humbled as Isaiah was. And may we be conformed more to the image of Jesus Christ. Change us to look like your Son. 
That's our desire, and I pray that we would see him very clearly as we go through this passage and these, these, uh, this study over the next few weeks. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our topic is the seven churches of Revelation. The seven churches of Revelation, God is revealing some things to us here. And as we mentioned in our Bible study this morning, the Revelation, the book of Revelation, many times it's called the Revelation of John, Revelation of St. John, the Revelation of St. John the Divine. My Bible says the Revelation to John, which I like. Because as we read back in verse 1, the Bible tells us it's not the Revelation of John. It's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So I want us to remember this morning, it's the Revelation to John the Apostle but a revelation of Jesus Christ and a revelation for the churches. That includes us as a church, but specifically, there are seven churches in Asia, which we'll look at as we go through our study. But today, as we begin this introduction to the, to the seven churches of Revelation, we want to know first who it's revealing. It's not revealing the churches. It's not revealing John. It's revealing Jesus Christ. So remember, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we think about Jesus Christ, the first thing we want to think about is his person, the person of Jesus. And we see that starting in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the one that is being revealed. Well, how does the book reveal him? Well, the first thing we see are his attributes from verse 5 to verse 8. And from Jesus Christ, notice how the Bible describes him here, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, here just in this first verse, we see some things about Jesus Christ. We see some of his attributes. He is a faithful witness. He is the first begotten of the dead. What does that mean? It's talking of his resurrection. We just celebrated that last week on Easter. Jesus is the first to have this glorified body after the payment for sins. He had that body. He would appear and he could move. Now, Jesus always had omnipotence, but he put that aside. Uh, om omnipresence, I'm sorry. As God, he could be all places at the same time. But when he appeared in, as a man on this earth, he limited himself in the person of Jesus Christ to be in one place at a time. Well, he had a glorified body after, after his resurrection from the dead. And we know that we also one day will receive that glorified body. Jesus Christ being the first of that new, the begotten of the dead. What his dead produced, his death paid for our sins and has given a new life, a new type of body, that glorified body. Jesus resurrected body, the first begotten of the dead. Then also, and still in verse 5, we see he's the prince of kings of the earth. This means he is the ruler over all governments. We know that God raises up leaders and he puts down leaders. Every government that is in place, God has chosen them to be there. Many times they think they got there because of their wisdom, because of their political ability, because of their wealth maybe. But God is the one who allows and removes leaders. He is the prince or the ruler of the kings of this earth. Still in our, in our Bibles, verse 6, "...hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever." Amen. Verse 7, "...behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen." "...I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come." the Almighty. So we also see that he will come in the clouds. He's somebody, he is a real person. He's going to come in the clouds. We see some of his attributes here, identifying who is this person of Jesus Christ. There's no more faithful person than Jesus Christ. No better witness than Jesus Christ. And the life that we have and the authority that we have comes from Jesus Christ, who is the one who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending, which is and which uh, was and which is to come. Well, those are his attributes, but as Jesus Christ is being revealed in this passage, we also see his appearance. His appearance. Now, there's a lot in this passage, 
And it's important that we see these things because his appearance, how he is described here, is going to help us understand how he's dealing with the churches. And we'll see that as we go through this morning. Again, our purpose in studying this, first, first of all today, is to see who is Jesus Christ. We're not going to understand the book of Revelation if we don't know who Jesus Christ is. So Jesus Christ, what is his appearance as John sees him here? Starting in verse number 11. Verse number 11, we see, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So now we know who is speaking. Jesus is speaking to John. And now John tells us, starting in verse 12, what he sees. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Wow, what a thing to see. What an appearance John saw in the person of Jesus Christ. He says, I saw one like unto the Son of Man. And if you go back and read the Gospel of John, we see John often referring to Jesus as the Son of Man, identifying with his humanity there. Jesus, John knew him very well. He had ministered with him for three years. He knew what he looked like. But the first thing we see is that he was surrounded by the golden candlesticks. And we'll see later those candlesticks refer to the churches. Those seven churches are the seven candlesticks. And then still in verse 13, we see his clothing. We see his head and hairs were like wool in verse 14. And his feet were like brass. It shows that strength, but also that shininess reflecting the fire which was there and showing also the powerful judgment of God. Again, his eyes as a flame of fire, peering in and, and refining and purifying what he sees. But then continuing in verse 15, a roaring voice, uh, his voice as the sound of many waters. When I think of the sound of waters, I think of when I've crossed at Kuruma Falls and I hear that water rushing underneath that bridge. It's moving very fast. The whole strength of the Nile coming into a narrow pass and the rushing of the water. It's loud. Jesus' voice was as the sound of many waters here. And then we see he had seven stars in his hand. Later we'll see that those seven stars are referring to the pastors of those seven churches. But I love the picture here. Those stars are in his hand. Oh, our, our Savior holds us. We are his. He keeps us well. He has a purpose for us but he's holding us in his hand. As we look in the heavens at night and we see the stars which are there, every star he holds in their place. He knows exactly where they're supposed to be, and he's the one that put them there. In fact, we know he knows them by name. The stars of the heaven, if he knows them, he knows each one of us. Then his countenance, his face as the shining sun, the glory of God shining brightly. And then in verse 18, he holds the keys of hell and of death. He's holding, maybe in his left hand, he's holding keys in his right hand. He holds those stars. He has a voice that's roaring. We saw that he has, uh, his mouth is like a sharp two-edged sword coming out. Just as the word of God is considered a sharp two-edged sword. The word of God, what proceeds out of Jesus is his word. But it's a sword which pierces and divides and shows us truth. Oh, that picture. It shows us the holiness of Jesus Christ. It shows the judgment, the power that he has. 
And when we see him for who he really is, it should humble us. If we have not, anyone who's not accepted Jesus Christ, to, to really see him in his power and as the judge that he is, should bring fear. Because there is a judgment coming. Everyone is going to stand before the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Jesus Christ is the righteous judge that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 4.8. Everyone will stand before him, and everyone will bow before him. But those that have not received his payment for sin, they will be judged with that sword of his word, with the power that he has, with that feet of brass, the fire of his presence, which is there. His appearance. John saw his appearance. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to be studying these seven churches that we find mentioned here that we read back in verse 11, but we're going to see them, a letter written to each of those seven churches. And what I find very interesting is that in each letter, Jesus references one of the things of his appearances, and he ties his appearance and his holiness with his authority in writing the letter to them. Let's look at some of those things as we continue our study, his appearance to the churches. In Ephesus, in chapter 2, verse 1, he talks about the one, he says, I'm the one that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, we see that in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1, the seven golden candlesticks that he's, that he's walking amidst. As we look at Smyrna, in chapter 2 and verse 8, Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Well, back in verse 18, he's identifying himself as that, I am he that liveth and was dead. The context of his message to the churches is going to come, again, from how he identifies himself and that hope that he's giving to each one. As we continue in Pergamon, Pergamus in verse um, chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, To the angel of Pergamus write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Again, that's what comes from his mouth, the sharp sword, a sharp two-edged sword, the word of God as the basis for truth. Um, <clears throat> for Thyatira in chapter 2, verse 18, the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Again, that is the idea of, of trying or refining or proving. You know, brass, when it is polished, it's very reflective, but when it's stained, it's not very reflective. Uh, the fire was, a, was what they would use to refine metal, to heat it up, remove the dross, and to purify. And we see how he's going to purify Thyatira, uh, Thyatira here. Still continuing, Sardis chapter 3, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Again, the seven stars that he holds in his hand. The, the comfort that we have of knowing he holds us, but also the authority that he has, because he's the one who holds us. Still to Philadelphia, in chapter 3, verse 7, he says, Write to the church in Philadelphia, These things saith he that is holy, that is true, he that hath the key of David. The key of David refers to Jesus' right to royally be on the throne of King David. God had made a promise that there would be one to sit on the throne of David forever. Jesus is the one who holds that key, that power, that authority. Now, he also holds the keys to hell and death. All power, he told his apostles in Matthew 28, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus is the one who holds the key. Sometimes we go places, especially right now, we might go to a particular shop and we find it's locked because of coronavirus lockdown. Or we might go someplace expecting it to be open and we're told the man with the key is not here. Well, Jesus is ever present and he has the keys. He has the authority and he has the right to sit on the throne of David, but the authority over sin, death, and hell. And he's encouraging Philadelphia with that. And lastly, Laodicea. We see in chapter 3, verse number 14, Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, 
These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now we already saw back in verse 5, Jesus is the faithful witness. But we also see then in chapter 1, verse 11, uh, that he was the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and he's the beginning and the end. Alpha, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first there that he is saying. And to the Laodiceans, he is reminding them that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Not that he is God's first creation, but he is the one who was the creator. He began the creation of God. There, without him, nothing that was made that was made, uh, John says in John chapter 1. In, Jesus is the one, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus was the beginning, the beginner, the one who began creation. Not just the original physical creation, but He is the one that is the beginning of us existing as a new creation. It's because of Jesus Christ, and our life is hidden in Jesus Christ. Oh, many truths that we're going to see applied as we go through looking at these churches. But that appearance, Jesus is saying, you need to see who I am, so it will change what you're doing. Each church, he's going to address their actions, and he's going to come to them in a different uh, appearance, addressing some of those different things of how he appeared to John to say, my message for you is important. Look at me. Look at who I am. And God wants us today to see Jesus Christ for who he is. Why is he taking time to do this? Why does he want us to see these things? Well, we see a purpose then that he's giving to us here. Back in, in Revelation chapter 1, there's a purpose in verses 1 and verse number 3. Verse 1 tells us, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The first thing that we see is God sent it to us to show, to demonstrate, to reveal to us. He wants us to understand. He came to show us this truth. And again, that word shortly means quickly. It doesn't mean immediately, but it means that when these things happen, they're going to happen rapidly. It won't take long. And as we go through the rest of the book of Revelation, when the prophecy begins, it's just a little over seven years for most of those events to take place up to the beginning of the thousand-year reign. Now, of course, a thousand years will take a while, but even that will move quickly compared to eternity. Uh, and these things, once they begin, they will progress very quickly. And that's the meaning of the word shortly here in verse number one. But he wanted to show it to them. He wanted them to be aware because not only would it happen quickly, there's nothing else that must happen before these events can take place. There's nothing which has to take place that we say, well, God, Jesus can't come back until this happens. He could come today. And what a glorious day that would be. Jesus, when he comes, it'll be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It will not take long. It'll be instantly, and then it'll set in motion the events that we see here later in the book of Revelation. They will shortly come to pass. He wanted to show that. He wanted us to be aware. But then he also has another purpose, and that is to bless us. Notice verse number three. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. There's a blessing, three parts to the blessing. Those that read it. Blessed is he that readeth. Did you realize we are blessed just to read the word of God? Sometimes people are afraid to, to go through the book of Revelation. There's so much I don't understand. You're blessed just to read it. But better, not just to read. He says, blessed are they that read and they that hear. When we listen to God's word, we're blessed again. Once we're blessed for reading it, blessed again when we listen to what God has to tell us. Pay attention as we go through. Sometimes as we, if we're going through a Bible reading plan, sometimes there's this temptation to just get through the chapters. Okay, wow, four chapters today, five chapters today. Let me just read, read, read. But we really don't think about it. 
There's a blessing that comes from reading, but there's another blessing that comes from listening. Oh, I encourage you, Christian, as you read the Word of God, listen to it. Look for God's message for you that day. Every day as I read, I try to look for something that God is saying, this is what I want you to meditate on today. Make notes in a book, on some paper, maybe in the margin of your Bible. If you're using an app, many apps have the way of of putting notes right into your Bible app. That's how I do mine. Every week as a family, once a week, we share something that God has, has been teaching us through our personal devotions. We share that in our family devotions. I encourage you, as you read the Word of God, be blessed for reading, but be blessed again for hearing, listening to it. But there's a third blessing He has for us. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear, and keep those things which are written therein. There's a blessing for reading, a blessing for, blessing for listening, and thirdly, there's a blessing for obeying the Word of God. God doesn't want us just to hear His instruction. He wants us to obey it. He does not give us instruction just to see, well, let me see what they're going to do. Are they going to do what I tell them or not? No. He has a purpose for everything. If He tells us not to do something, He's protecting us from some evil that would come upon us. If He tells us to do something, He's leading us in the paths of righteousness to where He wants to give us more blessing. He just said, when we obey, there is yet a third blessing for us. His purpose in giving us this book is to show us who He is and what He's going to do, but also to give us more opportunity to receive His blessings. I encourage you, be faithful in spending time in the Word of God. There is a blessing that He gives for us, and that is part of the purpose that He has in giving us this book of Revelation. Well, the last thing I want us to look at this morning, we've seen the person of Jesus Christ and the purpose of the writing, but then there, the, the time of these uh, churches, the writing to these churches, are viewed as periods. And uh, in, the, in the scriptures here, there's a, a past, a present, and a future. And we see that first in the letter that is written here in this revelation. There's a past, a present, and a future in verse number 19. We mentioned this in our, in our Bible study this morning. But notice what he says here in verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The past the things you've already seen. John, you've seen some things, right? What you have seen. But John, there are some things which are right now. That is the the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Right about right now. But then also the things which will be hereafter. Sometimes people view the book of Revelation as all prophecy for the future. Sometimes they look at it as things which have all already happened in the past. But the Bible tells us here that, and we'll see this several times, there are things that John was writing, some of them had already happened. Some of them were happening right now, and some of them were in the future that would take place later, and John is getting a vision of the future. So it's important to understand all three of those aspects are there. The past, the present, and the future are in the letter. But why is that? Well, I believe that part of it is The purpose of this book was to reveal who? To reveal Jesus Christ. And when we think about Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, we know from Hebrews 13, 8, He's always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same. He never changes. Before He entered the earth, while He was on the earth, after His resurrection and ascension up to now, He is the same Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, his actions have varied when he was creating the world. That was different than when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives teaching his disciples. But he was still and is still the same person. Still in Hebrews 13, we're encouraged that he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, that same Jesus that was ascending up is the same Jesus that is promising us today, I will never leave you. As the disciples were standing watching Jesus ascend up into heaven, I can't imagine what went through their minds. But the angels came and told them, this same Jesus who you've seen go up, he's going to come back in the same way you've seen him go up. Remember what John wrote earlier, he is going to come with the clouds. 
Jesus is coming back. But even though physically his body has ascended, spiritually he has never left us. He is in us, we are in him, seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And he says, I will always be with you. Matthew 28, 20, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Oh, those promises give us that hope in our Savior, Jesus Christ. But just as the letter deals with the past, the present, and future, what's interesting when we think about Jesus Christ is he is past, he is present, and he is future because he's eternal. He always exists in all times. And so as we think about our Savior, Jesus Christ, in verse number four, he is described as the one which was, which is, and which was, and which is to come. Jesus Christ, he was, he is, and he is to come. And we saw those as we went through in verses five through eight, things that he's done in the past. We see that he was the first begotten of the dead. That's already in the past. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. That's already right now. That's in the present. He's loved us. That is forever. He washed us from our sins. That's in the past. He hath made us kings. He's already done that. And God was telling John, write the things which you have seen. And he's telling us about Jesus Christ. What he's already done for us. What he's doing right now. And what he's going to do in the future. Oh, if we understand these things, we'll have a much better understanding, a revelation of Jesus Christ. He was, he is, he is to come. Still, still in chapter 1, in verse 8, he says, I am the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Again, we see these same, these same uh, things described, but he says, I am, that's right now, Alpha, that's beginning, that's past, and Omega, that's future. So even in those names, I am, I'm the God who is, is the meaning of that name. I am beginning, Alpha. I am ending from the beginning up to now, up to the end. Jesus Christ is there. Again, in verses 11 and 17, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Verse 17, he says, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. Again, I am meaning I'm present now. The first from the beginning and the last. When, if everything else goes away, I'm still there. The last is there. And in verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. He was dead. We remember that last week as we celebrated Easter. He died. He died for our sins. But he didn't remain dead. On the third day, on Easter Sunday morning, he arose. He liveth. Even now, he lives. He continues to live, and he will be alive forevermore. And that is the hope that you and I have. Because he lives, I live. My life is in Jesus Christ. As long as he lives, I will live. It has no bearing on what I do or don't do. It all depends on Jesus Christ. And as we see Jesus going through the book of Revelation, it gives us hope. It's going to give us more power. We have his power, but it will it'll allow us to use that power more freely as we surrender to his Holy Spirit to live and to work through us. Our God is alive, and He is going to be alive forevermore. We had some great songs last week that some of our church members sang, and I love that message, that He's living now, but He's going to be alive forever. And because of Jesus Christ, we also will live forever. If you don't have that hope, you're missing out. You've really not seen Jesus. You might have heard about Him. You may have read about Him. You might have read the Word, and there's a blessing for reading the Word, but there's another blessing for hearing it and obeying the Word of God. And Jesus says, Come unto me. If you've never come to Him for salvation, you're missing the whole point. You've missed everything because you don't yet have spiritual life, and He wants to give that to you. We'd love to share with you from God's Word. Remember, it's all about Jesus Christ and the Word of God, not somebody's opinion. But he says how he will give you that eternal life as a gift. The wages, the payment for sin is death. That is what you owe God. 
because of sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is what he will give you if you accept his payment on your behalf. The payment is death. Jesus died. Have you received his payment? If so, are you living in that victory, living in that hope? We can look around and we see coronavirus, we see lockdown, we see challenges, and those are there. But I think what John faced was probably much worse than what we faced. And John said, it's my joy for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to go through all these things because I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Savior is alive and He lives forevermore. We have a hope. And our hope is not in government. Our hope is not in a job. Our hope is not in neighbors. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Even if this life, which is temporary, is shortened, we have an eternal life, spiritually. And then we'll have that new glorified body to live forever, physically in the presence of our Savior. Oh, what a day that will be. His coming could be today. He said, I'm going to show you the things which must shortly come to pass. Are you ready for Christ's return? Well, if we can be of help to you, please contact us here at Faith Baptist Church. Again, our phone number is 776 14 We'd love to help you. You can contact us through text message, phone call, or on WhatsApp. Uh, you can also email us through our church website, www.faith.ug. Thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you.